Good afternoon. Yeah, okay. um, I, I will just let the um, people be beginning to beginning to um, slip in. Um, it's lovely to see so many people. Um, okay, okay, um, great. Let's let's get started. So, a very very warm welcome to, to everyone. Um, this is the first uh, seminar in our Oxford University Caribbean Studies Network series for the spring and our first seminar of the year. Um, we're absolutely delighted to welcome um, to our seminar today, Faith Smith, who is a professor of African and African-American studies and English at Brandeis University in Massachusetts. Um, professor Smith is an authority on the literatures and intellectual history of the Caribbean in the 19th and 20th century. Uh, and a lot of her work has focused on the wonderful kind of Trinidadian polymath, John Jacob Thomas, who was the subject of her first book, Creole Recitations, which was um, a book that when I was in, a, you know, a graduate student, everyone was reading, uh, and I remember finding extremely kind of exciting um, at the time. So it's, it's really exciting for me to, 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 to hear, to, to meet Faith today, uh, and, and I've been really excited about this. Faith's also an expert in um, the history of sex, duality, and gender in the Caribbean, and has edited the collection Sex and the Citizen Interrogating the Caribbean in 2011. Um, today, Faith's gonna to be talking about her new book, um, which is called Strolling Through Ruins, the Caribbean's Non-Sovereign Modern in the Early 20th Century, um, which I know has been much sort of anticipated for a very, very long time. We're really, really excited that we'll get a a glimpse of it uh, now. So um, without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Faith, uh, who's going to uh, talk for a while. A document will come up in the um, in the um, sidebar that you should be able to access, which will give you a list of some of the references that, that Faith's talking about. So feel free to, 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 to kind of click on that and use that as, as Faith is talking. Um, and then uh, at the after the presentation, we'll have a Q&A. As, with, as in the past, um, I'll do the file has just appeared now, so you should be able to see that. As in the past, uh, just stick questions in the Q&A box um, and I'll work through them. Uh, if a question occurs to you while Faith is speaking, you can even put it in then so you can begin to populate the box um, as, as we're going along. Um, but so don't, don't be shy and do uh, you know, uh, get, get involved in the discussion and we'll really look forward to that. But for the, for the moment, um, I'll disappear and hand over to Faith. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for that introduction. It's morning here. We're just digging ourselves out of a snowstorm. And for those of us who are teaching this term, it's the first day of full in-person classroom interactions after two weeks of virtual teaching. I want to say first that I'm speaking to you from an institution that occupies unceded Nipmuc, Pawtucket, and Massachusetts land. I'm going to use the next half an hour or so to talk about the book I'm finishing, Strolling Through the Ruins, the Caribbean's Non-Sovereign Modern in the Early 20th Century. I kind of just stop suddenly at some point, 25 minutes from now. Um, I'm very happy at that point to either read some more or um, to take questions and comments. Thanks very much to the Caribbean Network for this invitation and the chance to talk about this project. This book follows, as you've just heard, my study of the 19th century educator, John Jacob Thomas, and completing it will allow me to turn my full attention to another project that examines literary and visual culture since around 2010 for its mapping of past, futures, and genealogies of kinship and intimacy in the context of the Caribbean's complex experiences with sovereignty in our global present. You might recognize the term non-sovereign as the term that Yarimar Bonija uses for her proposition that the territories of the contemporary Caribbean, whether they're independent, commonwealth, overseas dominions, departments, or revolutionary republics, that these categories are less important than Caribbean territories' roles as non-sovereign entities that have sustained the fiction of the North Atlantic's secular sovereignty. This is a bleak account that interests me 
and that is in line with other bleak accounts of our present. And I'm listing different kinds of accounts here for the next few minutes. I understand that these are not the same as each other, but they all interest me. The right to claim a range of sexual and gender identities in the region, for example, sometimes terrifying and heartening on the same day in its consequences, is often met with popularly endorsed appeals to colonial era legislation to enforce heterosexuality and gender conformity. Appeals to colonial law in post-colonial time, reiterated in popular music, sermons, and other discourses, or enforced by the keen quotidian scrutiny of armed forces, accounted for the enforcement of section 153 of the Summary Jurisdiction Offenses Act of 1893, deeming it illegal for anyone being a man in any public way or public place for any improper purpose to appear in female attire or being a woman in any public way or public place for any improper purpose to appear in male attire. This so-called cross-dressing law allowed Guyanese authorities to charge a group of gender non-conforming persons with being wrongly attired in female clothing in 2009. And as you might know, it was struck down by the Caribbean Court of Justice on November 13, 2018, after years of appeals by four of those arrested, Gulliver McEwan, Angel Clark, Peaches Fraser, and Isabella Prasad. Um, when the Jamaican Armed Forces cracked down brutally on a Western Kingston community for its support of Christopher Dudas Coke in 2010, support expressed in divine and regal terms, they were punishing but also making more visible a figure whose business interests and patronage equaled and even transcended that of the govern government and the state. Extending across the US as well as deep inside the city's neighborhoods, Koch's influence represented a parallel sovereignty, even as his extradition to the US and subsequent incarceration rehearsed Caribbean sovereignty's limits. Reports about the treatment of Windrush era migrants to the UK, freely landed travelers who became presumptive British citizens, were striking to me in the context of the continuing revelations of historians who are following the money as they trace the court claims of British citizens who sought part of the 20 million pounds in compensation granted to slaveholders for the loss of their human property when slavery was abolished in the British Caribbean in 1833. In the 2020 summer of corporate apologies for anti-Blackness, the compound interest and other instruments of accumulation that continue to activate the wealth from enslavement indentorship and the post-emancipation period were missing from the calculated phrasing, the indefensible wrongdoing that occurred during this period. It is inexcusable that one of our founders profited from slavery. Such phrasing insists that the past came to an end in the past. The cynicism and despair about two 1960s projects charged, perhaps burdened with expectations of political and social freedom, that this, this cynicism and despair is another thing that I'm thinking about. So on the one hand, the political independence of some Anglophone Caribbean territories in the wake of decolonization across Africa and Asia. On the other, the US Civil Rights Act of 1964, but also the radical projects, including Black power movements in the Caribbean and the US, and the Cuban and Grenadian revolutions that promised to counter the liberal constraints of those formal legislated agendas. So there's a disillusionment in our present moment about all those projects, whether liberal or radical. This disillusionment has been analyzed in the context of interrogating Caribbean government's ramped up scrutiny and punishment of citizens' sexual behavior to compensate for their economic and political paralysis and to um, reassessing who had been included in promises of freedom at the time of Anglophone Caribbean independence. And then in also in reconsidering the assumption that African-American leaders involvement in the highest echelons of the wielding of US state violence by the early 
21st century was a good and inevitable outcome of the civil rights movement. Two commentators reflect on our present in terms of outlasting ruination. In terms of quote, and I'm quoting David Scott here, living on in the wake of past political time amid the ruins specifically of post-socialist and post-colonial futures past in the case of the Caribbean. And then in the US context, and here I'm quoting Aliyah Abdul Rahman, a, a present that is simultaneously post-free and not yet free. This formulation requires a modality, Abdul Rahman suggests, that eschews the heroism of Black past and the promise of liberated Black futures in order to register and revere rapturous joy in the broken down present. What does this sense of having outlived the future allow us to see more clearly about the past or about what we have taken for granted regarding its proper narration? Finally, finally, for the, the, um, the, the ways in which the present have prompted um, some of the present contexts that, that are behind uh, my interest in the early 20th century, I found that the late 20th and early 21st century novelists I was reading paid keen attention to the earlier 20th turn of the century moment, whether it was Ramabai Espinay's consideration of the precarious status of bamboo wives as part of a mournful engagement with familial silence and loss, or Nelly Rosario's return to the beginning of US occupation in the DR to excavate the intimate histories of occupation. In Zadie Smith's White Teeth, Clara silently recalls a family story of Jamaica's 1907 earthquake at a moment when the patronizing liberalism of the Chalfans requires a genealogical narrative from her that parallels the photographs, diagrams, and written accounts that stabilize, solidify, validate, and preserve for posterity, a family in which everybody knew whose children were whose and the marriages were singular and long lasting. By contrast, Clara's family tree, as well as that of her white working class husband, is marked with births described as haphazard, paternity unsure, copulated with, brought up by grandmother, and child's name unknown. And one conclusion that we could draw is that diasporic subjects in the UK have no corresponding monuments that can deliver family histories from furtiveness or transience. But Zadie Smith is careful to ground Clara's maternal history in the freedom of white Englishmen to impregnate black women in Jamaica and simultaneously generate white children in singular and long lasting unions if they wish to do so. Thus Smith shows that a willed blindness permits nationalist accounts of English genealogies to excise imperial relations and their violating consequences. As another character, Alsona notes, the English want to teach you and steal from you at the same time. Thus on a January 1907 day, when an earthquake strikes Kingston, Clara's, Clara's grandmother is pregnant and in labor with one Victorian gentleman's child, while another Victorian gentleman's hand is up her dress. This is a hatterclaps of haphazard consequences that is born on her body and that she bequeaths to succeeding generations. These are different kinds of accounts gesturing towards issues of intimacy, gender identification, genealogy, inheritance, um, and sovereignty, whether personal, communal, national, state-endorsed, or law-breaking. Such accounts, I believe, in their very bleakness, free us up to return to moments in the past without being conscripted to a prescribed sense of how things turned out in the future. Failure, if that is what it is, or disappointment or disillusionment, these allow us to reimagine how things were supposed to turn out. In this project, I turn to the close of the 19th century and the first decade-ish of the 20th in two British Caribbean colonies, Trinidad and Jamaica. I ask what it means to think about imperial identity in these two colonies, when, for instance, in the last week of February 1900, 
revelers in Trinidad's capital, Port of Spain, embodied the postures of General Piet Cronier and his Boer troops surrendering to British forces in Southern Africa's Orange Free State for that season's carnival masquerade. Standing in formation on the Savannah on Pretoria Day later that year, Trinidadians in Port of Spain joined others in the colony and across the globe in saluting victories in Southern Africa. In the reign of Victoria, we marched on Pretoria. This we in the Trinidadian Calypsonian Duke of Marlborough's tribute to the victory is the sort of Anglophile sentiment that might explain why this era of Anglophone Caribbean history sounds disconcerting to later generations or at any rate uncomplicated in its imperial loyalty. Turn of the century Anglophone Caribbean time seems nondescript, out of joint. It is too late after insurgent acts making slavery unsustainable led to the 1833 Emancipation Act and after post-abolition had to clap such as the state's murder of hundreds of protesters in Morant Bay, St. Thomas, Jamaica in late 1865 and of religious celebrants near San Fernando, Trinidad in late 1884. Too soon before discourses that tend to be claimed for early nationalism, such as Trinidad's beacon period of the 20s and 30s and the labor strikes and demonstrations that swept through the region in the late 30s. And generally too proud of its imperial identity to be included in lineages of resistance or of the nation to come. But what if we do not think of this period of Anglophone Caribbean life in terms of mimicry or belatedness or of anticipating or refusing nationalism or a nation, a future that we know is down the road, but instead a sizing up alliances at a moment when every Caribbean territory, whether independent such as Haiti or part of the Spanish, French, British, Dutch or Danish empires is keenly aware of being wedged between some European imperial project and increasingly also US imperial inclinations. Genealogies of the Anglophone Caribbean should attend to this era's own sense of its ability to frame its past, future and present and listen keenly to its own um, account of its, um, if, as, of its own modernity. My focus on two British Caribbean territories in the last year of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th puts me in what has been called a quiet period that remains understudied in the British Caribbean. If quiet runs against the grain of resistance and other concepts that we have come to value, what happens when we cannot prove resistance without a doubt? when resistance seems less interesting as a goal or disposition than other aspects of a spectacular event, or when without other kinds of legibility, all we have is quiet. In this quiet period, what might the obscure or nondescript give us? Quiet is also violent routinization, as in the intensity of many, many small cases through which the weight of the law is most intensely felt. I'm, I'm, I'm quoting Dana Payton there. When police and magistrates wield the power that most working class people experience from the judicial system. This is an intensity that suggests the hum of law and a building up by wearing down of the capacity to endure its violence. A humdrum that is repetitive, unrelenting, probably unremarked. Hum is also a modality of quiet, quoting Tina Camp here, an undervalued lower range of quotidian audibility that enlists us to attend to its very banality. Most of this book's action, such as it is, occurs on the cusp of events that could be said to mark time more productively including a period identified with a global imaginary of Caribbean intellectuals in the US, and that's Michelle Stevens' term um, for her discussion of that, of um, a, a period that I precede 
um, in her book, Black Empire, um, the beginning of the First World War in 1914, and Haiti's occupation by US Marines beginning in 1915. So I barely ever get to, to even to those points. For Caribbean subjects in Trinidad and Jamaica confronting and shaping their discursive milieu at the convergence of multiple temporalities and geographies, what do sovereignty and freedom mean at this particular nodal point of empire? European interests across the Caribbean concede and contest US supremacy while continuing a pivot to Africa, Asia and the Pacific intensified from the mid 19th century. The US stabilizes its interests in the region in the wake of what comes to be called the Spanish American War which allows it to open the new century with considerable political, military, and economic power in Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam, the Philippines, and Hawaii. And this following decades of internal colonization of First Nation and Mexican communities and land, and the codification of citizenship as coterminous with whiteness with the exponential increase of public lynchings and in legal enactments of exclusion and segregation, including Plessy versus Ferguson, and looking ahead to the military occupation of Haiti and the DR and the purchase of the Danish Virgin Islands in the next decade. As I track these imperial maneuvers in the context of the massive and consequential movement of Caribbean people to the Panama Canal Zone, to Costa Rica, the US and other locations, I pay even more attention to what it means to move back and forth and often on foot between two colonies, rural environs and their respective capitals, Kings, Port of Spain and Kingston. In these cities peopled mainly by single women, streets, markets and botanical gardens are charged sites of encounters between jamets, queens, night women and new women, and the men who are so unnerved by them that their texts are a powerful expression of the energies and anxieties of this historical moment. As non-white and non-elite people attempt to take advantage of new opportunities for accumulation and mobility in this moment, or at least to try to secure relief from oppressive regimes of labor and surveillance. And as white, near white and non-white elites stri strive to retain moral and economic dominance in part by mocking others as social upstarts, someone must bear the brunt of this mockery or learn to deflect it onto others. These are processes of destabilization and reinvention that mark a particular conjuncture, a period during which the different social, political, economic, and ideological contradictions that are at work in society come together to give it a specific and distinctive shape. The set of material conditions within which one is compelled to think and to act. Migration is the great feature of Anglophone Caribbean life in the later 19th and early 20th centuries, as travelers from these territories and from Haiti, the Francophone Caribbean, the Indian subcontinent, China and West Africa, entering or leaving the Caribbean, fan out across the region, as well as Central, South and North America to work, sometimes also attempting to return with supplemented families and capital to the territories they left. Centering British Caribbean people and their journeys in this period, Lara Putnam refers to all the lands that migrants made part of the British Caribbean world, syntactically attributing a transformative cartographic and agential power to travelers who, compelled to leave hard times in one territory, often find themselves fueling anti-foreign and nationalism in the territories that they helped to make prosperous. Noting an almost exact temporal overlap of two patterns of migration in particular, 1838 to 1917 for Asian indentured labor into the Caribbean and the 1850s to 1920s for Caribbean migrants to Panama, the collaborators of the Digital Humanities Project, Panama Silver, Asian Gold, Migration, Money, and the Birth of Modern Caribbean Literature, point out 
that it was the accumulation of these two groups of laborers that helped to fund the education and the social mobility of the intellectuals identified with the national struggles and cultural production of the 40s and 50s, including the Windrush generation of writers, even as the mobility and accumulation of these laborers would be repudiated as crass. Before the phalanx of social scientists and reformers peering into barracks and tenement yards and bedrooms in order to speak with authority about the intimacies of working class Afro and Indo-Caribbean people in a period that we associate with the 1920s to 1950s. In this earlier moment, in my moment, Kodak wielding tourists emboldened by US triumph in the so-called Spanish American war or religious leaders and newspaper editors debating the effects of unmarried parenthood, train their eyes on people who are returning from cutting cane and chopping lumber and building canals and fighting others' wars elsewhere, and also on people who haven't left the region at all. Strolling in the ruins is as interested in discerning their response to being the object of this surveillance as it is in their own participation in the consumption of racist media coverage of, say, events in Southern Africa in 1900. If the Caribbean offers a unique vantage point from which to reconsider itineraries that have tended to define and overshadow the early 20th century, including modernist ones that consign the region to an aesthetic periphery, or nationalist ones which privilege particular events or dispositions, then seeing the Anglophone Caribbean as a shadowy presence and bridge, th these are Michel Stevens' words, a shadowy presence and bridge between the British metropolis and the US global power, presses us to reimagine both this historical moment and our relationship to it. A bridge affords a vantage point from which to consider the adjacency of two imperial powers, while a shadowy presence suggests the immaterial, the inconsequential, or the ghostly. Neither roiled by political clamor for change like its Hispanophone and Haitian neighbors, nor apparently desirous of being so, the Anglophone Caribbean can barely be discerned in relation to its noisy neighbors, nor in relation to its own noisier pasts and futures. Riotous activity in Montego Bay, Jamaica in April 1902 and the March 23, 1903 water riot in Port of Spain feel relatively minor compared to political upheaval elsewhere, an impression intensified by the trek of political exiles from the 19th century and continuing into the new century from Venezuela to Trinidad and from Cuba and Haiti to Jamaica. Depending on the commentator, this means that the, Car the British Caribbean is stable and level-headed or that it is stifled. I'm asking what is breathing quietly or seething between non-revolutionary stability and order. As the US inherits military, economic and political dominance from Spain and other empires in the Caribbean and elsewhere, and in the latest phase of its own longstanding relationship to the Caribbean, I'm interested in how this involvement can be made legible when, unlike its own internal continental expansion, or unlike Europe, the US eschews formal settlement. Performing non-monarchical imperial governance its directives not necessarily made by the Congress or the president or the Republic. US power asserts itself in the wake of older orders of conquest and enslavement, including on its own soil. This is demonstrated when US magnate Andrew Carnegie suggests that the US ought to exchange the recently acquired Philippines for the British Caribbean and Bermuda. It is evident in the social power of estate managers hotels, railway stations, and ships connected to the United Fruit Company in towns with banana cultivation across Central America and the Caribbean, as well as in offshore naval squadrons, squadrons performing friendly maneuvers. Moreover, European imperial assertions have to be understood as shifting in reaction to the more insistent pressure of the US. 
How does power issuing from a monarchy measure up against power without this? We're tracking then how sovereignty feels in this era. How do Caribbean people and territories incite or inspire as well as manage and endure this multifaceted imperial posturing? So one thing I do is look at the, the um, I guess, again, so-called Boer War through the eyes of Caribbean onlookers who are celebrating these victories or taking advantage of patriotic parades to perform dissident acts. I also consider what it means to think about the Cuban independence war that comes to be called the Spanish-American war. Um, so I'm asking what we can see when we look at the events in Southern Africa and in Cuba from the vantage point of Trinidad and Jamaica. As Cubans flee to neighboring territories such as Jamaica, I'm interested in fiction published in the late 1940s and set retrospectively at the cusp of the new century in which Jamaicans go to Cuba to help Cubans fight Spain. And so part of my interest in these two wars in Cuba and Cuba, the US um, and, in, and in Southern Africa is that it, it, it helps me to kind of locate the particular nodal point of a new imperial century. Other, um, some of the novels published or set in this moment are bound to disappoint, though hopefully productively. The stilted prose, forged letters, and misrecognized kin of some of them feels melodramatic for an era that has come to be defined in terms of the emergence of modernist agnosticism and ironic detachment. The setting for some of the texts is the country estate that is the near rural second home of cocoa planters or that is the actual site of working sugar mills and cattle pens, striking to me on the cusp of an era in which novelists join anthropologists, social workers, um, novelists and social workers in scrutinizing the intimate lives of young single women moving from a rural landscape to the yard yard of the city. It is also striking from a future in which the politically transformative act is to burn down the estate's great house or otherwise harm its owner occupants, or at least to stroll through the ruins contemplating its demise. These characters want to take their place in the great house as owners, thank you very much, part of the trajectory of proving their moral right to befriend, share power with, and inherit or recover the wealth of local and visiting white elites, and to do so utilizing the vindicating discourses of a global African descended talented 10th. So part of the negotiation of power of that moment, in other words, is to understand how it is located in the context of changing imperial configurations and how the Caribbean middle-class subject can convince different kinds of authorities to share this power. In these texts, we see Caribbean people negotiating photography in, in, as they understand that tourism spurred on by the opening of the, up of the region in the wake of imperial wars, the activities of the United Fruit Company, um, all of these create a demand for a certain type of landscape and subordinated subject. As Krista Thompson has shown, the era's photographs of Afro and Indo-Caribbean characters posed on donkeys, these photographs deliver a quaint non-modernity for tourists imagined as modern. I read the cultural production of this moment as responding to this, um, to this visuality, this scene of visuality. Finally, I want to say that one of my key interests here is tracking the deep disquiet about women's erotic and economic autonomy and the implications of women's desires, appetites, and inclinations. Which male-headed household she's attached to, her maternal or non-maternal decisions, whether she can live in a household of her own choosing, and how this is linked to issues of wage parity with her male counterparts in the labor force, who exercises control about how her wages are spent and whether she stays or returns to a place of origin, whether this is um, deemed 
uh, rural, uh, back to a rural location from her new home in the city or back to another territory. So whether she returns or stays or moves back and forth. A useful formulation of women's temporal relationship to modernity posits them as inert, backward looking and natural as a symbolic bearers of the nation or some other constituency denied any direct relationship to agency in contradistinction to their forward thrusting potent and historical male counterparts who bring into being registers of time and action that are discontinuous, progressive and radicalizing. This is a gendered experience of time, progress and attachment to a collectivity that could just as easily be uttered by at least two constituencies, by colonial and imperial authorities charging women with the responsibility of teaching children the perceived cultural origins and civilizational legacy of the group and positing all colonial and imperial subordinates as children who require protection and by anti-colonial male nationalists feeling feminized and infantilized by such imperial conceptions and making similar appeals to a degraded um, present and to promising past and futures, if only the women and the non-elites they understand themselves to be leading would assume their allocated positions. But far from inert, it is precisely women's movement whether from one household, workplace, merchant, or customer to another, or across geographical and other borders that produces anxiety for onlookers, whether such onlookers are neighbors, lovers, newspaper editors, spiritual leaders, colonial officials. Their purchasing power or their perceived yearnings shape the advertising and display of goods or stimulate the economy even as they're viewed as provoking inappropriate desires. Though arguably all working class people offend the status quo for some reason or another, and though condemnation for violation of gendered norms of womanhood sometimes applies to all women regardless of class and race and some men as well, it is non-white working class performances of womanhood in particular that are held to be too assertive, too public, too commercial, or otherwise unappealing as to undermine masculine authority or cast their community as insufficiently moral or modern. But they offend precisely because their modernity surpasses notions of propriety. In a 1911 poem by Claude McKay, the female persona, a working class black woman, warns a black constable whom she accuses of palming her up in the streets that he will feel the pinch of time because you don't wait for your glass. Subjecting him to a proper abusing in the public domain, though the Jamaican Creole tracing, the, 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 though the Jamaican Creole term tracing seems as apt here as the Eastern Caribbean term for capturing the dramatic and public rehearsal of an opponent's ge genealogical history in order to shame, a strategy of self-recovery that involves the other's undoing. So subjecting him to a proper abusing or tracing, she dresses him down literally as she makes clear that his ill-fitting police uniform bespeaks his unsuitedness for what was generally recognized to be a socially mobile occupation for black men. As she and her silent interlocutor know very well, the prevailing vagrancy laws render it completely legal whatever his or her intentions may have been, for him to arrest, and I'm quoting from one of the, um, the clauses of the vagrancy law, the 1902 vagrancy law, to arrest every common prostitute who shall be found wandering in any public place and behaving in a riotous or indecent manner or annoying passers by soliciting them. Even if what constitutes the annoyance is that she refuses to accept his prior palming up, he can assault her and then lock her up for soliciting. If the poem can be read as capturing her vulnerability, it also renders him a victim of her verbal abuse and as part of the social apparatus of neighbors and onlookers who conspire with the colonial authorities to thwart black men's attempt to turn the new imperial century into new opportunities for mobility and political participation. 
Following Sarah Nicolazzo's lead, we want to see how vagrancy laws seek to contain socially, economically, and sexually disruptive bodies, and thus how the conjoining of sexuality and the law brings into focus a Black woman and a Black man who are both subject to vagrancy laws, but also its strolling enforcers. The terrible intimacy of this moment is that on the streets, in the bedroom, everywhere, such laws, sometimes newly amended in this historical moment, circumscribe the movements and aspirations of the descendants of enslaved people, as well as currently and formerly indentured people. For if she can be arrested as a riotous wanderer, we will see how the men of this class are subject to arrest by other clauses of the vagrancy laws. And this is where I've, I've stopped. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was, I mean, yeah, there's all sorts of things. We don't have enough time to pick apart a, a, a tenth of those. Um, but that was so, so fascinating to hear that that, that little glimpse into the, um, the new book, the new project. Um, so as I say, um, the Q&A box is now uh, there. It's open. Um, so um, if you have any questions, uh, get, get them in the, the, the sort of the earlier, the better. So I have a sense of, of, of how, how many you know, people are, and how, how quickly we need to, to rush through them. So, so get, 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 get typing. Um, I'll, while you're doing that, I'll, I'll uh, um, take the, the privilege of, of asking the first question, which I suppose is a, a very open uh, question. I'm, I'm really fascinated by this kind of interest in the kind of non non monumental moments, the the, the quiet uh, humdrum moments. I, lo I love the way you're kind of picking that apart, um, and and also in this idea of the kind of you know looking closely and trying to find interest in the behaviours of people who seem to be doing, who, who who's whose kind of sense of whose whose radicalism is I think in the, what you said at someone in the beginning is at the very least kind of non straightforward, um, if if it's you know, if it's really discernible at all, um, and I wondered sort of where the in, where the interest in this had come from, and and how it connects to Thomas, because this sort of really interestingly kind of dovetails with this, I you know, this look at, at Thomas, this kind of very ambivalent figure. So yeah, that was my sort of opening thought. Thanks for that. In some ways, Thomas then is is. Um, I, I mentioned Thomas very briefly in this project, and I call him, if anything, a prickly uncle for mm -hmm. the generation of the for the generation that I'm looking at, because if Thomas is someone to be kind of admired from afar as somebody in the past, as somebody who dared to question, who as somebody who stood up for his territory. Mm -hmm. as somebody who stood up for the Caribbean as a kind of valid space and so on. Um, the, the, the generation I'm looking at wants to, um, wants to be suave. If you, if you think about the presentation and the, even the sartorial presentation of, mm. of what comes to be called a talented tenth, for example, mm -hmm. the generation I'm looking at wants to, to be seen as suave, wants to be seen as um, polished and um, in, 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 even, even as they are asserting the, the, the right to share in political participation or whatever it is, they, they don't want to be seen in any way as um, being, being bested by the other, right? Mm -hmm. They want to be seen at, so in, so in, 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 Rupert Gray, a novel that I spend a lot of time kind of thinking through, and in some ways, the novel that I'm trying to work out in this whole project, I'm trying to understand mm -hmm. it. So, so, so it's 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 that novel that leads me to photography. It's that novel that leads me to kind of think through the Boer War and so on and so forth. But in any case, um, in that novel, when Thomas's name is uttered, it's by a, a character who is literally stuttering. So that's Thomas's. So, so, so for me, there's something about the stuttered iteration of his name that says he he can only slip in 
as somebody um, who, who has to be kind of placed in the corner and revered, if anything. The, 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 the way in which he confronted power is not going to work in this moment mm. if we're going to be seen as kind of um, understanding the, the array of power in front of us and also being seen as equal to it. That mm. there's something about Thomas I'm, I'm proposing that feels as if he got beat down. And, mm. and, and in this moment, we don't want to be seen that way. We want to be seen as being able to kind of not just take it, but to kind of invite you in for tea mm. as well. Cause we're, we're, we're hardier than that. We're better than that. And we look good in a suit. So mm. I, so I think that I, so, so in some ways, so, so that interests me, as well as the fact that from a later moment, this is, this is a generation and these are novels that, I mean, it's the, it's the uncle at, you know, it's the, it's the uncle at the um, funeral service who's going to be quoting Tennyson, right? That, mm. That's how we look back at that generation. It's like, really? Did he, he, did he just say that? And to some extent, that's that's how I entered this. Um, I entered with that attitude, and I'm and I'm trying to understand how how to see the world as as they saw it. In other words, not to to just see them as or not to see them at all as um, you know as kind of just um, completely inundated by the completely taken in by Englishness, mm -hmm. but in fact, as um, uh, persons who are integrating all of these um, uh, registers into their um, personality and trying to meet the tremendous imperial, kind of multi-imperial um, registers of power that they're faced with. Mm. That, that idea of suaveness and the sort of sort of sliceability of it is absolutely yeah is incredibly rich and um I if we weren't pressed for time I'd ask you a follow-up question about strolling um as a as a kind of mode of yeah. suaveness but um we we're, the the, the Q and A box is already filling up um so uh just just following on from that you sort of began to talk about some of the literary texts you were looking at um Ruth. Uh, Minute Eggleston asks, "Hi Faith, does the activity Hello, of Adolf Ruth. Roberts connect? Sorry, does the activity of um, <laughs> reading that like a computer? Does the activity of Adolf Roberts connect with his this argument? So, what's the role of is, is Adolf Roberts kind of germane yeah. to this project? Hello, project? Ruth. Um, yes, yeah, so so I do pay a lot of attention to W. Adolf Roberts' Single Star." And that's a, so. So you will know that Roberts published many, many things, and including many novels. And the novel I'm very interested in is the 1949 novel *A Single Star*, and that's the one in which it, that's set in the late 19th century, set in the I guess the 18 1895-ish, so late 1890s. And in that novel, a Jamaican. Um, a Jamaican, because he meets Cubans who are fleeing what's going on in Cuba, he returns with them to Cuba to help them fight the Spanish authorities. And so I, I read that um, in relation to another novel published that year, New Day, 1949. Mm. So, which, so in other words, I'm seeing Robert as a kind of interesting figure in a generation that we've come in, in the, the Windrush generation. We don't think about Roberts at all, mm. right? And so I'm trying to kind of think about how the, the novel, what's going on in the late 1940s, that's making Roberts think about um, the turn of the, the, the early 20th century, the, the, the cusp of the 20th century as a moment um, to kind of think through. And, and in, so in my reading, part of what's happening there is that he's trying to say to um, um, nationalists or whatever the word is that we're going to use um, in Jamaica, um, you, you need to understand imperial power and you need to understand that um, it's important to shake off the British in particular kinds of ways. So, so when you're looking for independence, let's look at what let's look at Cuba's relationship to Spain 
and to and to U.S. forces. Um, how can that be a lesson for us um, in the late 1940s? A single star also interests me because of throughout the throughout the text, I'm very very interested in um, the allure of the estate and the great house, mm. and so um, just kind of moving through. The, the Cuban, the ravaged Cuban landscape, I guess the, ru the ruinous uh, Cuban landscape um, with um, Roberts's characters interests me a lot, even as the, the, um, the protagonist who is a, a white Jamaican son of, of landowners returns to Western Jamaica to his own kind of estate milieu and so on. So yes, I do look at Roberts. Thank um, you. Wonderful. Um, we've got two questions, one from Jean Beasley and one from Ayesha Denise. I'll ask the one from Jean first, just because it sort of stays with this question of the, 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 the text and, it, and then we might move on to the, the other question. Um, and, and this one's about Claude McKay. Um, uh, and the two questions, one, would you say, sorry, what would you say about Churchill's appropriation of if we must die in World War II? And two, do you see McKay's banana bottom as, quote, melodramatic and stilted? Um, and she says, thanks so much for this bomb of a presentation. Um, so, yeah, two, two questions about Claude McKay. Yeah, so, so it's, it's me. So, um, sorry. Uh, the, the first, the, the first, can you say the Churchill yeah, thing again? Sorry, the first question is, what would you say about Churchill's appropriation of oh. If We Must Die in World War II? Was the first yeah. question. I mean, the first thing to say is it's it's terrible that is uncredited and so on and so forth. But it's a kind of um, it 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 tells you that it's the kind of sentiment that is that can be um, fashioned or refashioned or or retooled for different kinds of projects, right? So even in um, even in the moment that McKay writes it, um, which I tend to teach in relation to what's happening in the so-called Red Summer of um, 1919, as, as Black veterans are returning to the U.S., having fought for the Allies in, in Europe, the, the poem itself doesn't doesn't say this is 1919 and it's about the Red Summer. You know what I'm saying? So. Uh, for whatever I can say about Churchill uh, and, and, the, and the use of it and the, the non-credit to McKay and so on, um, the, as, a, as, a, as a document, as a text, um, the, the, the poem can be taken up in, in different kinds of ways. And so um, McKay is using it uh, on my reading and be because I teach it in relation to McKay's um, M M McKay's world and so on. On my reading, I am kind of thinking through how the the, the commands in the poem um, ask for a kind of honorable, you know, this we're going to die, but at least we have control over how we will die. Mm -hmm. um, and so it doesn't surprise me that in a in another moment, um, the, the the kind of formality. Um, of the of the prose and of the and and McKay's use of a traditional form is going to be kind of seamlessly um, useful for this other project of um, pro, you know um, shoring up um, U UK patriotism and so on. And then the banana bottom question is lovely. I mean, for me, that's like a formative text, hmm. and so I had to kind of restrain myself a little bit. Because really, I wanted to. I'm very. I was in this project. I was trying to just stick to a period that I don't know very well, and so therefore, the McKay I needed and the McKay I wanted was just when he leaves. He leaves Jamaica in 1912, never to return, and so I. I had to. I'm, I was forcing myself to stick to the the poetry that he published. He publishes two books of poetry that year. In you know while he's in Jamaica as a constable sitting at his his desk at the halfway tree um, precinct station, banana bottom is important for me because it um, yes it is stilted and it's all those things but my goodness 
what one of the what that novel does is to um on my reading it 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 both marks the vulnerability of black um men and women to that what i was calling that humdrum the the weight of of colonial um that sense of colonial transgression except in McKay's work, it's black people who enforce that. It's your neighbor, it's your it's your lover who drags you out of you know from under the bed in the uh, when you go and visit your your schoolmistress girlfriend, right? And so you see in every page there how black people are subjected to this sense of always being um, watched and always being seen as sexually transgressive. That, that's McKay for me. But what McKay does is uh, on the other hand and, and what I'm trying to, to show in this, this text is that he also, as in the poem I quoted from, he also somehow manages to make black women because he's trying to um, critique a kind of, um, um, you know, proto-feminist or um, uh, kind of what he would call bourgeois reading of the black family life, he 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 wants to show that non non-marital, non-formally married black people are good people, are wonderful mm -hmm. people, and so for me, what that does though is that it it ends up celebrating. Um, uh um black female sexual vulnerability as mm -hmm. as in the way that the, that that novel turns it in turns beta's rape um into a song for the ages i mean th th so the community is trying to wrestle with it but at the end of the day it feels to me as if it says well you know at least she gets she gets a, a british boarding education she gets all these other things out of it so that for me is the complexity of McKay, where he's registering the harm, but he's also in some way in the same moment showing black women kind of magically being able to, to, bear, the, to bear that harm because mm -hmm. that's just how we are, we bounce back, and showing black men somehow then as, as the victims of that harm, which they are, but then it's alongside black women mm -hmm. who are somehow able to bounce back. So that's part of what I'm trying to work through. So thank you for that question about Banana Bottom. Okay, we've got two minutes left and we've got two questions from sure Aisha Denise. Um, and I suppose both of them turn on the kind of, um, the question of kind of the motivation of this project now. Um, so there's a question, the, the one, one of them is about, you know, was, she, she says, was uh, your, your focus on Trinidad and Jamaica tied in with uh, the 60 years of their, in, in, in her inverted commas, uh, acquiring of independence. Um, and the other one is about Windrush um, and how this kind of, that the, the Windrush uh, deportations might have shaped your work on the project. So I suppose it's a, it's a quite, to, 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 to join those questions together a little bit. Yes. Why, why now? Think, right, I can, so, so I was, I've been writing this book for a long time. And in fact, it's really three different books at this point kind of mudged, um, squashed into one. And so the Windrush thing, the 2012, 2015-ish, um, come, you know, offered a way of kind of highlighting what I had been thinking about anyway, in terms of the, the kind of ongoing aftermath of, um, of, of just different periods of, of devastation, whether you're going to talk about um, compensation and the historians following the money, whether you're going to talk about what happens in, you know, in the post-war period when the UK needs its subjects and so on, and then at, at another moment when it 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 doesn't need them. So it's like, why are you still here? And so on. And so it it, it got folded into my account of my present situation, but I had been, but it hadn't been part of the project as I was beginning it. Though in a way you could argue that um, Zadie Smith, Ramabai Espiné, Dion Brand and other novelists in the late nineties and at the kind of cusp of the nineties in a way are 
prefiguring it you know what I, you know what i mean in in the way that they're they're kind of trying to understand how these borders don't want certain kinds of citizens and so on and that that has to be seen against um in a certain historical context and then very quickly um the Trin trinidad and jamaica gosh i can't read my writing yes it i mean it, in this post 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 independence period um there is there is a certain kind of disillusionment that I was trying to talk about that gets marked at sometimes as tragedy, anti romance, etc, etc, etc. And it's, of course, I think it's easier in those kinds of moments to to go back to um, to go back and be to go back and be critical or to go back and look at less heralded moments, because there's a kind of th um, the, the project of, you know, um, whatever it is, 1962 just feels it, 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 it's, 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 it's not something to kind of celebrate. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that post post colonial moment um, in a, in a way, yes, is, is kind of the mode in which 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 produ which produces certainly my disposition, but also a willingness to go back and look at, you know, why did why do we think that what they're saying in 1900 means that they want a nation at the end? Like like mm -hmm. where does it come from that th that the nation or the nation that looks like this is the mm -hmm. end point that people had imagined? I think sometimes maybe we're more likely to ask that kind of question when we are um, sitting, sitting in a present where things, things haven't turned out in a particular kind of way and we're kind of sitting in the reality of that. I hope that's clear. Um, that's extremely interesting. We could keep talking um, and uh, un unfortunately another seminar will need the use of this Zoom account. Um, so we must stop, um, but just to express again, all of our you know huge thanks to uh, Professor Smith for coming and speaking to us today and sharing work on this ex ex extremely exciting new project. Um, in two weeks time, uh, Rocio Zambrana, uh, who's a professor of philosophy at Emory, will be coming to speak to us about her new book, which is out with Duke called Colonial Debts, uh, The Case of Puerto Rico. So do sign up for that on our website. Um, but for now, again, thank you so much to, to, to Faith and um, uh, thank you very much for, for to, to you all for joining us today. Um, Thanks bye -bye. very much. Bye. Hi. <laughs> that was absolutely fantastic. Thanks so much. I really appreciate this. <laughs>